Chris Mannix, member of said media. Chris, you get lied to on a regular basis, don't you? Oh, you have no idea how many tall tales are told during the reporting of mock drafts. <laughs> I mean, I was on the phone with, with Mitch Kupchak and Flip Saunders all within the last week, and you know, I, I, I listened for certain things, but if they told me who they were draft, I would assume they were drafting somebody else. Don't you assume that they're lying to you or they're not maybe not lying to you as much as they're not really telling you the truth? Yeah, I mean, I, well, no, there are people that when they're, when they're on the record, I don't think they're going to expressly lie. When they go on background, when presumably you are supposed to get the truth on other stories, that's when I think you're getting the lies. That's when I think, you know, <laughs> well, I heard that this guy had a tremendous workout and boy, didn't Emmanuel Moutier dominate his workout here when none of those things happen. That's when these guys try to manipulate the system a little bit. That's why the, the mock draft reporting is kind of all out of whack because background off the record is usually a good opportunity to get real information. In these situations, it's the exact opposite. All right, Steve Kerr is getting a lot of credit today after last night's moves. Should he be? Yeah, because... Andrew Bogut has become utterly useless for this team, and, and that might be the most surprising storyline for me uh, all series. Bogut's been, been really good for them for well, all season long, really, and, and I'm shocked he's getting so outplayed by Mozgov. And, yeah, it was a bold move, and you saw how well Mozgov played against smaller interior defenders, but I think being quicker, uh, more versatile, absolutely helped them. They survived that 7 nothing surge, and from then on, uh, they dominated that game. What if they lost last night and Steve Kerr made those changes? How would the media yeah. be? Yeah, he, he would have taken a hit, especially if Mozgov had the game that he had and and if somebody else had gotten off. But, I mean, Dan, this this Cleveland team, I mean, they're just bad. I mean, outside of LeBron, and I guess Mozgov when small six, seven guys are guarding him, they're, they're just not a lot of, of talent there. They spent three games playing way over their heads. And, and everyone that's followed this series, and everyone that I've talked to at home, uh, GMs and the like, have all said with Cleveland that have all felt the crash was coming, just fatigue-wise. Yeah. Della Vadova couldn't keep playing like this. LeBron, as great as he is, couldn't keep playing 45 minutes a night as the focal point of the offense. At some point, this had to come crashing down. Now, the question was, would it be in Game 4 like it was last night, or Game 6 or 7? But at some point, this was coming, and unfortunately for Cleveland, it came uh, earlier than they wanted to. Yeah, I, I just was surprised in the previous game that he didn't do this, that he didn't uh, try to force the tempo. They allowed LeBron to dominate the basketball and made it a Cleveland-style game. And that that's what you – know, I give him credit for doing it last night, but uh, he should have been leaning towards this in the previous game, game three, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think they could have gone to a smaller lineup a little earlier. They did a lot in the second half uh, of game three when it became abundantly clear that – it, you know, Bogut was just not going to win these battles with Mozgov. Moreover, for the first three games of the series, David Blatt seemed determined not to play Mozgov against these smaller lineups. So it was a benefit for them to take Bogut out because Blatt was going to counter with that Thompson and LeBron James uh, type of lineup. But I, I think it was effective. And frankly, I don't really think, sitting there watching that game, I didn't get a feeling that Golden State played all that well. I mean, they played well enough to beat a battered Cleveland team, but you know, Steph Curry didn't play great. I mean, Green played pretty well. Uh, you know, Clay Thompson played decent. But this wasn't a, a vintage Golden State game. I think those games are still in the bank for them and yeah. could come out when they get back to Oracle. Yeah, that that's what I was saying after last night's game, that you win by 21, but... Steph Curry and Klay Thompson didn't have their typical games, and you still you still won that. I you know I still look at Golden State winning the next two. Well, uh, yeah, that's because I mean, in the NBA, more than any other sport, the best team almost always wins. You, you don't get a hot pitcher that can win three games for you like baseball. A hot goalie. It's not like football where it's a one game elimination. You have the occasional eight one seed upset. And that's a big story, but you go through the books. I mean, you rarely do you see a team that, that, that wasn't more talented, better on paper, not win against an inferior one. He's Chris Mannix from Sports Illustrated, their senior NBA writer, joining us, Dan Patrick Show. If LeBron can't shoot those free throws, is he not allowed back in the game? 
Yeah, that, that, I kept thinking about that in, in the two minutes that I was listening before I, I came on. I, I sent a couple of text messages and I made one quick phone call. I think everybody from the NBA is now on the charter headed back to uh, uh, to Oakland. But I, I, I want to say that he can come back into the game. because, And I only say that because when Damari Carroll went out in that Atlanta series, I distinctly remember you know, getting a, a PR note saying Carroll injured knee will not return. And it, it struck me, why would they say he will not return if he couldn't return? Uh, plus, it doesn't make a lot of sense that a guy couldn't return because wouldn't you know, that be a game plan for every team coming out to just clobber LeBron James trying to knock him out so he can't shoot a couple of free throws? I think it's just that a coach can pick whoever he wants to shoot free throws on the bench, but the guy can come back. Uh, NBA draft now less than two weeks away. How do you see the top five playing out? Yeah, I, I think the bigs go one and two, and and I have this conversation with Kupchak and with Towns and Okafor uh, being one two, and and I talked to Kupchak about the value of bigs, and and it's still there. The, the game has evolved to the point where you have to almost have like an Orlando circa two thousand nine team around a great big with you know a Dwight guy and a bunch of perimeter shooters to be successful. But if you have a great big and there's something like that on the board. You jump up and you take him. Um, so I think they go, you know, Towns goes one because Minnesota wants to play fast, and you can send Carl Anthony Towns to Kevin Garnett College for at least one year, and he's going to get better that way. Okafor will go to the Lakers. It gets a little murky after that. I think Philadelphia takes the point guard. Is it Russell? Is it Moutier? They're working these guys out over the next couple of weeks. That would go a long way towards figuring that out. And then you have the Knicks, who I've been told are going like, I mean, like five different directions. There's a, a lot of conversation in the Knicks front office about which way to go. Some people like Moutier, some people like Justice Winslow, a lot of people like uh, Kristaps Porzingis, the kid from last week. I'm just thinking about this, Dan. Imagine being in the Barclays Center with all the Knicks fans that are going to be there, mm. and they announced they drafted Kristaps Porzingis. I know. They might not let that guy out of the building. <laughs> Who you, you you fall in love with somebody every year? Nobody falls in love quite like you do. So who are you falling you, in? You you know this, and I, <laughs> I had to text you this because I was watching highlights of him, and I was smitten as I'm watching highlights of him. It's Mario Azonia, the uh, kid who played over at Barcelona this past year, an athletic European guy, a go to the basket type of a European guy, can finish at the rim, six seven six eight two guard. Probably going to go in the seven eight range. Maybe to Denver, they could use some of his position. This kid has the flat out stud potential. Love him in the draft this year. Can you? Who do you compare him to? I, I don't know because you don't, you don't see a lot of, of of European players that play like that. He's got he's got great size, and he, one of the problems he had overseas last year was that when you when you have teams like in Barcelona where that you you know these prospects are going to go to the NBA. They tend not to commit much time and resources to you. They don't play you a lot, and his own you fell into that uh, that category. So it, some of his, his numbers are a little bit skewed, but I just haven't seen too many European players that are that aggressive and, and play that well going to the basket. Come on. I need a white guy comparison here, man. I, I can't make a white guy. I mean, can we call him Gordon Hayward-esque? <laughs> Andre Karolenko? No, Karolenko, more of a defensive guy. You know, Zonia's not that defensive oriented. Hayward was, you know, Hayward's a very good offensive player. He's he's an aggressive kid too. So I think that's the somewhat fair white guy comparison. No, I, I he's lo- not sneaky athletic though. He's actually athletic. And you know, Minnesota's. Um, well, no, I, I won't even go there with your your boyfriend Ricky Rubio. I'm not Don't. Gonna, I'm not he's going to be a. He's a big part yeah, of their he, core. Yeah, hell yes, he Huge is. Part. He better be. He better be. Point guard of the future. Yeah, they couldn't use Steph Curry in Minnesota. Well, that was a David Kahn mistake from a couple of years ago. The bigger, mistake, the bigger mistake was not taking Steph Curry over Johnny Flynn. I mean, you know, that was the, the catastrophic mistake. But, you know, when, when I'm, Steph Curry comes up a lot when I'm evaluating draft prospects because especially a guy like D'Angelo Russell. People talk about Russell and they say, well, I don't know if he's athletic enough. Well, I, I talked to some Warriors coaches from when Steph Curry was a rookie, and they reminded me of the first summer league Steph Curry played in when he just got obliterated by like the Nate Robinson types at that summer league. And they were terrified that he wasn't going to be athletic enough to defend that position. What he did was he got smart, and he learned to play angles, and he educated himself on the position. And that overcame a lack of athleticism, and I think that taught me a lot about what D'Angelo Russell could be if he can do the same thing. Okay, here's the silliness of all of this. 
Everybody scouted Steph Curry, saw him in the tournament, saw him be a big-time player in the tournament. He went from a two to a one, so he'd be ready to play point guard in the NBA. And everybody worried about how fragile he was and could he guard anybody. Didn't we learn from Steve Nash to stop doing these silly things where we say, who can he guard? I always wonder who can guard him. Who could guard Steve Nash? We never bring that up, but we always say, who can he guard? Larry Bird couldn't guard me, but who could guard Larry Bird? we got to stop with that. I'm with you there because everyone wants to talk about, especially the guard spot. They want to say, this guy's coming out. How in the world is he going to stay in front of Russell Westbrook or Damian Lillard or Derrick Rose when the the fact of the matter is nobody stays in front of those guys? So it's not the it's not the end of the world (laughs) if these guys can't do it. You're right, though. I mean, I will say this about Curry. You know, one of the reasons he's making relative peanuts in this contract compared to what he should be making is because he was so fragile in those first couple of years with the ankle injuries. Thankfully, he got over it, but some of those fears were realized in the first couple of years with Steph Curry. Yeah, the ankle injury, absolutely. Uh, and, and I wondered if that was going to hamper him the rest of his career, but that's that's uh, long forgotten. Uh, safe travels out to uh, Golden State. All right, Dan. Thank you, Chris. That's uh, Chris Mannix, senior NBA writer. He's been lied to before.